Welcome to Argumentative Engines, a platform committed to the dissemination of knowledge through debates and discussions on issues that matter. I would like to inform the audience that this session is also being streamed live on YouTube. And towards the end, we will have a Q&A session where participants will be given a chance to interact with the speaker directly. So, Mahabharat, history or mythology? The Mahabharat, originally known as the Jaya Samhita and later as the Bharat Samhita, has been engulfed in a plethora of debates with respect to its nature, age, authorship, and historicity. The text can be classified as a Smriti, an Itihasa, as well as Kavya, consisting of 18 parts and over 100,000 verses at present. The Pusan stories centered around the internecine battle of Kurukshetra have enraptured the masses over the centuries and have instigated a force of active interpretation and deliberation, especially about the historical occurrence of these events. In the past few decades, several archaeological excavations have been undertaken at places mentioned in the Mahabharat, like Hastinapur, Mathura, and Kurukshetra, which suggests that these places were inhabited by printed greyware cultures around this time, with marine archaeological explorations also leading to the discovery of the submerged city of Dwarka. However, archaeology cannot prove or disprove the veracity of epic events as archaeology is best utilized for uncovering the general patterns of material culture rather than corroborating textual details of literary works. Some historians have argued that history and mythology need not be diametrically opposed to each other and others believe that they should be strictly differentiated. History can be understood as a broad term that relates to past events, not only as a result of discovery and interpretation, but also as a collection of memory and presentation. On the other hand, mythology revolves around symbolic narratives and metaphors of human experiences. Therefore, there is an area of convergence between the two. This leads us to question the strict dichotomy between mythology and history that came to the forefront in the era of positivism in 19th century Europe. However, epics like the Mahabharat, whose compilation spans from the 3rd century BCE to the 3rd century CE are bound to be affected by changing societal and uh, cultural circumstances. Therefore, we at Argumentative Indians call for a dispassionate understanding and interpretation of this recurring debate over the historicity of the Mahabharat and posed the question that was put forward by an eminent historian, and I quote, the, to the faithful, everything mentioned in the Mahabharat is true to the very letter, whereas, whereas the skeptic holds that the epic is nothing more than a mere figment of imagination. How then can one ascertain the truth? To speak on this topic today, we have with us Dr. Robert P. Goldman, Dr. Goldman is the William and Catherine Magistrati Distinguished Professor in the Graduate School at the University of California at Berkeley. He is the General Editor and the Principal Translator of the Ramayana of Valmiki and the author of Gods, Priests and Warriors, the Prabhus of Mahabharat. He is recipient of the President's Certificate of Honor for Sanskrit awarded by the President of India. Dr. Goldman, a very warm welcome to our platform. And we know that it is very early for you in the morning, but we would love to hear your views on the topic. So Mahabharat, history or mythology, sir. Well, good evening and thank you so much, uh, Doreen. And thanks also to Mayank Kalra for organizing this uh, event. And uh, also for my friend and colleague, Dr. Naina Dal, for having uh, recommended me for, to give this talk. And now I feel that Doreen has more or less covered the entire talk that I would have given so <laughs> perhaps uh, we'll try to add to that a little bit. And uh, I want to start in, in being argumentative a little bit. I mean, I think we're here to be argumentative. And I was going to argue with the, the title that was proposed, the uh, either or history or mythology, because uh, it's both of those things and much more than those things. And uh, I want to talk about the different elements in the Mahabharata seen from its internal perspective, in other words, with what the, the linguist uh, Kenneth Pike called the uh, 
emic view. And as she alluded to, the idea that the faithful believe it to be literally true and the skeptic dismisses it as, as total nonsense. Neither of those is really acceptable views for us because we also have the external view of it in a sense, not necessarily skeptical, but uh, critical uh, view. So um, I'm going to begin with a little bit of a, of a discussion of genre. What, what kind of texts are, are is the Mahabharata? And, and much of what I have to say also applies to the Ramayana, obviously. And in fact, the, the Mahabharata with its kind of absorptive tendencies has also absorbed the whole Ramayana story into one of its many uh, Upakhyanas, the so-called Ram Upakhyana. Um, these works are referred to frequently as epics. Uh, this is a term you know, deriving from the Greek epikos, a long poem or a long story. Interestingly, in, in terms of a modern view of these texts, both the editors of the uh, Bandarka Oriental Research Institute critical edition of the Mahabharata and the uh, scholars at the Oriental Institute of the Baroda who did the critical edition of the Ramayana both refer to their work as the national epic of India. So you can see already there's a certain politicization of, around these texts, which one is the national epic. Uh, but both works cross genre lines and Sanskrit literary criticism, which as many of you may know, has a very rich vocabulary of genres of literary texts, doesn't have a specific term for what you might call epic. Uh, what they have is this term itihasa. Uh, and these two works, Ramayana and Mahabharata, are the only works that actually fall into that category, itihasa. And what does that mean? And, and let me uh, start talking about it a little bit in terms of, a, of an older argument. And this is an argument that uh, spanned from the late uh, 19th to the early 20th century between two great uh, lions, you might say, of uh, Bengali literature. I mean, uh, Bankam Chandra Chatterjee on the one hand and Rabindranath Tagore on the other. So in 1886, Bankim published uh, a work entitled Krishna Charitam, or Charitram actually, as he called it, in which he argued that this work, the Mahabharata, was a historical work, but he called it a Kobita Moi Itihasho, to use the Bengali <laughs> pronunciation. That is a, a history made up of poetry, in other words, a poetized history. Uh, and that's a, a very interesting term because it's, it's, it's a true historical term, text, for which the authors have placed into a kind of metrical format, turning it into poetry, okay. Uh, about 10 years later, in an essay, uh, Tagore, referred back to Bonkim's work, and he, uh, he said, no, uh, he didn't believe that was the way to look at the work. He called it an oitehashe kabbo, that is a historical poem, rather than a poetic history. So already you can see there's a little bit of a tension between them. Bonkim's argument was that very well, on the terms of fantasy, fictiveness, you could take out from the Mahabharata a lot of the supernatural elements. Take out all the, you know, the wonderful parta shooting thousands of arrows in a single second and all this sort of stuff, but leave that to the poetic imagination, right? The, uh, the freedom of the poet to exaggerate, just as the authors say of the Iliad and the Odyssey and so on, bring in wonderful things, incarnations of div divinities and so on. But basically, he, he argued, this was an account of events that took place what he simply called Pura Bruttam, stuff that happened a long time ago. Now, the problem with verifying the historicity of the Mahabharata, of course, is that um, we don't have many historical sources outside the Mahabharata to verify, as Doreen said, the actual facts on the ground that took place uh, at the time of the events described by the poets, or particularly the, the imagined poet Vyasa, right, who was a contemporary of the action of the Mahabharata. Uh, so actually the Mahabharata speaks for itself as history in a sense, from this emic view. 
Uh, and in this view, Bunkim, it seems to me, seemed to be channeling the great Sanskrit poet playwright Bhavabhuti, eighth century poet Bhavabhuti, who in his act two, his character <clears throat> Atreyi describes, and this, this applies also for, for the Mahabharata, but this is a reference to the Ramayana, describes how Valmiki came to compose the history of Rama. And that is to say, the Ramayana in poetic form after having been made the first poet by Lord Brahma, that is the Adya Kavihi. And he said, and she says, for those of you who follow this sort of thing, that is to say, then the blessed Pratyasa composed the history, the Ramayana, which is for the first time among humans, a transformation of the absolute Brahman in the form of sound. This is this idea of Shabda Brahman, uh, the absolute Brahman in the form of sound. Uh, and that same idea of omnis omniscience, truthfulness, and linguistic brilliance obtains for Vyasa. <clears throat> so, how, looking inwardly, how does the uh, author of the Mahabharata describe his own work? Is he saying it's mythology? Is he saying it's history? What is he calling it? Right. And, and listen to what he says. This is from the Mahabharata. So the first thing he says, this is a kavya, <clears throat> an extremely venerable kavya, paramapujitam, right? I made this poem, which is worthy of reverence. And then he tells you what the contents are in his view brahman veda rahasyam cha yachan yatyapitam maya sango panishadanam cha vedanam vistara kriya itihasa purana nam unmesham nirmitam chayata so what does all that uh, mean i created this highly revered poem o holy one which expresses the secrets of the vedas as well as the other things that i have proclaimed these are the full explication of the Vedas, along with the Upanishads and the adjunct of science, that is the Vedangas. And I've also created here a full expansion of Itihasa and Purana. So for the reputed author of the text, it was all of these things. It was a poem, it was a history, it was a Shastra, etc. So, and this is what we see, the huge capacious nature of the uh, of the work. So how do we validate the history? As I said, there's there's very little external support for the historical events, which took place long ago. But we know that the characters existed prior to the Mahabharata, because many of them turn up in the Vedas. If you look through the corpus of the Vedas, including the Brahmanas and Upanishads, we hear about the Kurus and the Panchalas and Vasishta and uh, Vishvamitra and so on as rivals. Uh, and wars took place among the different groups of Aryan settlements in Northern India, the so-called, which emerged finally in what we would call the epic period into these kind of proto-states or Janapadas, some of which became rich and powerful and dominated others like Kosala, and then in the course of term, Magadha, and then finally the Mauryas and the Guptas and so on, as you all know, the historicity. So how do you validate this? So here you get this difference between the emic and the epic. For the modern scholar, what do you have? You have this references from the uh, Vedas. There's an interesting book by my friend and colleague, I don't know if he's here, uh, Dr. Kanad Sinha on, it's called From Dasharajna to Kurukshetra, in which he traces a lot of the Vedic antecedents of the epic characters, uh, which I recommend to you. Uh, and then there's archaeology, which, as uh, Doreen said, you know, turns up things like pottery uh, and, and it, 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 uh, evidence of some sorts of urbanizations that may have been flooded at some time in history. But um, we don't have chronicles from other sources about these events. And the archaeological remains we have found so far don't seem to justify the rather ex 
extraordinary urbanizations that are described in both epics, you know, as of Hastinapura and Indraprastha and Ayodhya and Lanka. There are these grand uh, urbanizations with palaces and fortresses and crenellated walls. You haven't found that yet. So, so what is it that provides the basis for the belief that we, uh, Doreen referred to that everything in this story is true? And this has to do with how ancient India viewed historicity, veracity, authorization. And this has to do with the fact that the authors of both works, Ramayana and Mahabharata, are not simply poets. They are rishis. And in that sense, they derive a lot of their authority from the way in which the Vedas were revealed to the ancient rishis. That is, is by direct vision. Because when you look at the secondary literature of the Vedas, for example, these rishis are also called drashtars, literally seers, we call seers. They saw those events. How did they see those events? They saw those events because they had, according to the tradition, a vision, a supernormal vision that is not common to the rest of us, what they would call the divya chakshuhu. They, in the case of uh, Ramayana, this was specifically granted to the Rishi Valmiki. You will see everything that happened in the life of Rama and his associates from the past and the present, and even things that have not happened yet. So this gives the uh, Rishi the credibility of the greatest of historians, because they are direct recipient witnesses to everything that they describe. This is the traditional view. And so people don't question it. And this is why people say people of faith, because after all, as I will mention a little later, these are also religious texts. People of faith say these Rishi saw, these were wonderful events that took place in eras that were grander than our own. Remember that these, uh, although scholars date the composition of these texts, as uh, Doreen said, you know, to between the fifth and century before the common era to sometimes to the second century after the common era, the events that are described in those texts are traditionally believed to be far, far back in history, many, many thousands of years back in history, because this has to do with the well-known yuga system of organization of uh, divine chronological time. So the Ramayana, is supposed to have taken place two yugas ago, right? In the Treta Yuga. And of course, things are more marvelous, more perfect, life is better, problems are less, extraordinary things are possible in those earlier yugas that finally in our own rather grim Kali age are not possible. Humans are smaller, weaker, short-lived, prone to crime, disease, and so forth, all kinds of things. So for them, it's not a stretch to say, all right, the Ramayana is filled with uh, flying monkeys who build bridges across the ocean and so on and so forth, because this was in a different age. <clears throat> Even Hanuman turns up in the Mahabharata to talk about that. He said, I can't take on the form I had back in the age of the Ramayana. So this is very self-referential. This is when Bhima encounters him. And uh, they, they're, after all, uh, half-brothers, right? Because they're both uh, Vayuputras. And he yeah. says, show me that form that you had back in the other yuga. And he said, no, I'm an old monkey now. I can't do that kind of stuff anymore, and so on and so forth. Finally, he does show himself and, and propound the theory of the yugas. So you move forward. Every time you move forward a yuga, everything gets worse by one quarter, right? So now you're down into the tail end, the waning days of the Dvapara Yuga, which is where the Mahabharata is situated. And it's on the verge of lapsing into the wretched future of the Kali age. But it's still a heroic age. So yes, in those days, you know, Bhima could carry all five of his relatives on his back because he was they were stronger than we are. You get this also this kind of idea in, say, if you look at a text like the Iliad, <clears throat> a similar age, perhaps, and a similar idea of ages, because the Greeks had a similar system of gold and silver and so on, ages. 
uh, and you'll get remarks by Homer, then such a hero picked up a stone so heavy that no two men living today could lift it. In other words, the idea that every civilization has it of a sort of golden past when men were stronger and more virtuous and so on. It's not unusual. If you read the Bible, you talk about the lifespans of the biblical patriarchs, and this one lived 900 years, and this one lived 700 years, and so on. But we poor mortals of modernity only live to 60, 70, or 100 years, and so on and so forth. So there's nothing remarkable about that or unique to India. It's a, it's a natural thing to think of one's glorious uh, past. So um, let's look at what's going on here. The, um, <clears throat> the basic storyline, as Doreen uh, suggested, involves uh, simply a, a, a not unfamiliar human experience, which is civil war. This is a, a war over power, land, wealth, cattle, women, because you notice women feature very centrally as objects of contestation in the, both epics, what with Draupadi and uh, Sita. Uh, between two cousins, that is Yudhishthira and Duryodhana, who are rival claimants to the same kingdom, right? So put simply, it's the kind of, on that lowest level, is a banal history of one episode in the age-old story of men fighting over land, wealth, and women. You know, the, the classic notion in India that what the men fight about are the three Zs, that is right, Zameen, Zali, and Zenana, right? Um, so... In that way, because Bunkim said, take out the supernatural, and then you have an actual history of a war. So uh, what's the closest analogy? We can look at ancient texts like the epics of other uh, civilizations, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, and so on and so forth. But I think, you know, from modernity, maybe a, a rough parallel would be what you would call the historical novel. So let's say we're talking, for example, about civil war, since that's the subject at hand. So, for example, uh, the American uh, author, Bruce Caton, has a huge trilogy about the American Civil War called The Killer Angels, right? No one can doubt the historicity of the subject matter. The Civil War took place. This we know very well. It's in modern history, finally. And most of Caton's characters are actual historical figures who took part in that civil war in one capacity or another, presidents, Lincoln, generals, soldiers, and so on and so forth. Those, those are real people. But he made up the story at the same time, because he's done the same thing that Vyasa and Valmiki have done, apart from the spectacular and uh, wonderful things, which after all are there to attract an audience, excite an audience, to make, make these tales of love, war, battle, very exciting. Because don't forget, these texts are media productions, if you like, the purpose okay. of which is to disseminate Vedic teachings and norms among a broader audience who had no access directly to the Vedas. They were too obscure, and in many cases forbidden. Remember, because you know the Shastras forbid women, Shudras, etc., from uh, learning or studying the Vedas. But this text, Mahabharata, calls itself the Veda for women and Shudras. What does that mean? That means that you can now take the teachings, the central teachings on dharma, on uh, religion, on society, on ritual, and offer them to a wide audience through popular performance. So people would imbibe these. You don't have to be literate to imbibe these. You don't have to be educated. You sit in the village or the city squares in the evenings and a Pauranika or a storyteller, a Kathakara, recites these texts, possibly in Sanskrit, but also will uh, gloss them in the local language. If you've ever seen uh, like Harikalak Shepa, or for example, in Tamil Nadu, where they'll recite the Ramayana, verses in Sanskrit, and then explain in Tamil, a kind of, uh, you know, a popular demotic Tamil, and the audience gets very amused and laugh and, and so on. So this is, this is what these texts were all about, teaching 
a broad swath of people how to be Indian, if you if you like. In other words, how to be acculturated into that Brahmanical culture of the um, Vedas with all of its wonderful and things and all of its things that in modernity we find somewhat off-putting, you know, the whole caste system, the exclusion, the treatment of shudras, et cetera, et cetera, the treatment of women. Uh, uh, for Sajid. So what you see is, let's say these characters, Arjuna, Yudhishthira, Dushodhana, were, were actual characters because there's nothing unbelievable about the story that they've quarreled over the kingdom. That's the subject of, of many historical events. So what did they invent? First of all, they put it into poetry. They also had that divine vision I mentioned that they can report to you exactly the conversations among all these people. Remember, both epics are a series of elaborate dialogues. They're people talking to people, right? Arjuna Uvacha, right? Vasudeva Uvacha, Rishaya Utru. He said this, she said that. Or in the Ramayana, it's in this formula, when he heard what he said, that he said this in reply. So all of these are dialogic, right? Well, like Bruce Catton in the American Civil War, he made up a lot of the dialogue, you know, because they're not a lot of it's not recorded in historical sources. Uh, so you make it up. And more to increase the joy, the pleasure, and the wonder, these people we're supposed to believe spoke to each other in Anushtuk meter. No, <laughs> people don't talk in meter to each other, but this is a poetic treatment of what these people would have said to each other in the imagination of the author, of the poet, who, for whom there's a suspension of disbelief because they are rishis, because both of them have a divine vision and you can't contradict them because just as the rishis who envisioned the Vedas created a text around them, which by definition is uh, unfalsifiable, right? This is the whole thing about the Veda, right? When you look at the analysis of the Veda on the part of the philosophical schools that focus particularly on the Veda, particularly the, excuse me, Purva Mimamsa, they have this notion that first of all, who wrote the Vedas? The answer is nobody wrote the Vedas because they are, Apaurusheya means they're not products of human activity, that these Vedas existed apart from humanity and prior to humanity. And the, the role of the rishis was not to write or compose them, was to see them and articulate them in the world of Shabda Brahma, right? So you get this idea. So how do you validate statements in the Veda, even if they're very remarkable? You don't, because by their very nature, they're true, infallibly true. And so the Mimamsikas say that the Vedas, unique among all literature, have this quality, which they call Swataha Pramanyam. Swataha Pramanyam means self-authorization. This has to do with Indian logic, uh, the system of epistemology. What are the Pramanas? What are the... the, the Bases for knowledge that we have. Different schools posit different lists of pramanas. But the ultimate pramana is Shruti. Shruti means the Vedas. So if you read Indian philosophy, Hindu philosophy at any rate, not, not Buddhist or Jain philosophy, obviously, but if you read Hindu philosophy like Shankaracharya or Ramanuja or whoever, Madhva, and since Indian philosophy is itself dialogic, as you might know. It's just a series of he said, I say, no, you said that. If you say that, I say you're wrong, and this is why. Uh, and you can argue on a variety of bases, but when it comes down to it, to ultimately win an argument, you can quote the Vedas. So you're, you, you say this, that's your objection. I say no, and then the Veda says this, and you end that argument, iti shrutihi. But you can't argue with that because Shruti is inarguable and so on. So these, that quality of the Vedas is in a sense carried over to 
the Ramayana and Mahabharata because they're also rishis. And they saw these things just as the Vedic seers saw the events of Indra killing Vritra, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this lends a certain kind of historicity that other societies may not uh, have had. But this kind of vision is there. If you look at Homer, by legend, was blind. And yet he saw all these events that took place at the Trojan War. Again, we have some uh, archaeological remains uh, of uh, Troy, uh, Schliemann and all of that sort of thing. But uh, we don't know what went on there. We don't know what Hector said to his wife and what Arjuna is, uh, not Arjuna, but uh, the other guy. So in this context, uh, I do have a question that yeah. can cross referencing the epics or uh, the Mahabharata with other texts, for example, Ramayan or Jaina or Buddhist texts. Can this uh, cross referencing or referring to the other texts help us establish a, a sort of chronology or its core credibility? Yes, I think, because first of all, the Mahabharata is acutely aware of the Ramayana. They refer to it numerous times during the course of the text. And then, of course, they encapsulate the story of the Ramayana in a lengthy passage, very lengthy passage near the end of the third book of the uh, Ramayana uh, called the Ramopakyana, which is a version of the Rama story. But it seems to be derivative of the Valmikian story, quite frankly. And when they disagree, it's an interesting thing. You know, different versions of these stories dif disagree in, in various ways. And the traditional pundits had different ways of explaining that kind of differentiation. One is a very interesting one, which is what they call kalpa beda. Kalpa beda means differences by different cosmic era. Because the theory is that, you know, the yugas complete themselves in a cycle of four, and then again, and again and again. So you have different cycles of the four yugas. And these same events take place in the same yugas each time, but not exactly the same. So they'll say, like, this is because this differs. He's talking about the Mahabharata from a different Dwapara Yuga. That's one way they do it. Or else they simply rationalize it. So I'll give you an example. Um, which is kind of telling in this way. You know, at the end of the sixth book of the Ramayana, when Rama has finally killed uh, Ravana, the arch demon, the terrible monstrous thorn in the side of the world, the Loka Kantaka, um, he surprisingly then tells his brother, Lakshmana, now give him a nice Vedic funeral to Ravana. And Lakshman is appalled by this. He said, no, what do you mean? He's, he's a horrible, villainous, terrible person, a rapist, a killer, a murderer, a defiler of sacrifice. And Rama says, don't argue with me. Maranantani, uh, Vaidani, all hostilities end with death. Do the samskara. So then Lakshmana dutifully performs the cremation of Ravana. Now, uh, in uh, the Ramapakyana, of the Mahabharata, what happens is when Rama sh shoots the fatal arrow at Ravana, the force of the force, the divine Tejas, brilliant splendor energy of his astra is such that it literally vaporizes uh, Ravana's body. So there's no body left. There's no question of, of having a cremation of body. So the commentator Govinda Raja on the Ramayana notes that you know, reflexively, she said, you know, uh, but the Ramayana, he said, but you can chalk that up to the poetic excess of the Mahabharata. The Ramayana that I'm commenting on, that's itihasa. That's what happened. Let the poet of the Mahabharata say this or that. But th that's just yeah. because it's a poem. So that sort of contradicts most people's understanding in the sense that many people think that the Mahabharata is the uh, original Itihasa, and the Ramayana, of course, is the Adikavya. It's just a poem, but it's not. Both texts are both are referred to by both terms throughout, Kavya and Itihasa. So people are aware uh, of, of uh, such differences. So, but basically, 
the Ramayana itself, and now I'm talking about a commentator from the 15th century of the common era. So, but the Ramayana itself has virtually no knowledge that it expresses of anything to do with the Mahabharata. Even when uh, the character Bharata in the Ramayana passes twice through the Kuru Jangala, as he calls it, the, the forest of the Kurus, doesn't make reference to any event in the Mahabharata. And part of the, when they move south, they hear from Vishwamitra all kinds of stories. This happened here and this happened there. They don't know or don't appear to know the Mahabharata story. The Mahabharata is, is quite uh, conscious of the uh, Ramayana, Ramayana, you know, this little just say this is just just like when Rama killed this and just like this. So that, that's my understanding of it. Uh, of course, you can, there's certainly a problem of argumentation from uh, uh, from nothing. But um, so, so well, the, uh, yes. yes so actually, so, well, there is a yes, please continue, sir. Is there a question or? So actually, so, I didn't have a question, but I will ask after you complete. So what I'm saying, if you, if you look at the question of poetry, right? Well, the Ramayana very clearly defines itself as a poem in its preface, the Upadgata. And the great literary critics, Ananda Vardhan and Abhigavagupta, treat the work as, among other things, that is the Mahabharata, a piece of literature. The first time it's really understood as a poem in a term of analytic sense. Right? They even create, especially for the Mahabharata, a ninth rasa, a ninth right. aesthetic emotive state to add to the eight traditional rasas that is posited by Bharata Muni in his Natya Shastra. Right? Um, so, um, So, but the Mahabharata, why does he do that? Why do they put, why do they invent a new rasa uh, for the Mahabharata? Because the Mahabharata defines itself uh, as a poem and also because the work has a certain poetic logic and, and a central theme. And that theme is not, is not, a, not, a, pl not a pleasant one in a sense because the, Ramay the Mahabharata is a text on dharma. In other words, it's also a shastra. And it teaches dharma in, in two ways. One is by a series of interpolated stories that are cautionary tales of things that ha happen to people who are particularly virtuous or particularly non-virtuous. So it has it, these it, reinforcing its message through these multiple upakhyanas, which bring in a whole lot of stories about heroic persons of the past, women and men. So there's Rama, there's Nala, there's Yayati, there's Dushanta, then there's Shakuntala, there's Savitri, uh, and so on and so forth. So you get all these stories of the past. So for the Mahabharata, the Ramayana story is also a story of the past, the Purabhrita, an epic within its epic. Mm -hmm. And so you get all these wonderful cautionary tales. Uh, but the Mahabharata itself is a grand cautionary tale according to the literary critics of the 10th, 11th century, like Abhinavagupta and, and uh, Ananda Vardhana, right? So are uh, you because... calling it a cautionary tale? Yes. Why? So... What is the cautionary tale? Because yes. it's teaching that for all this striving over wealth, power, and pleasure ends in disaster, Right. So this is, uh, as uh, Abhinavagupta refers to what he calls the Virasavasana of the Pandavas and the uh, their cousins. In other words, the wretched, miserable ending, what uh, Feldin Pollack called the, the anomi ascetic suicide and apocalypse of the Mahabharata. So Vyasa is creating a warning for us in that he, um, by telling you all these stories, uh, he has covered all the critical areas of traditional Indian civilization. That is, you know, the four Purushartas, right? Famously, Dharme Charte Chakame Cha Mokshe Cha Bharatarshaba Yadihasti Tadanyatra Yannehasti Natatkwachita. With regard to Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha, 
Whatever is here in my text, you'll find it somewhere else. Whatever is not here doesn't exist anywhere else. In other words, they're, they're making a claim of kind of uh, being coterminous with reality, so to speak. But there's a theological element here too, because not only is it a, uh, a historical, let's say, text, not only is it a poetry, but it's a theological text by bringing in and first popularizing the whole theory of avatara. So in that way, it becomes a Vaishnava Shastra, in a sense, because Krishna is God who enters the human world for particular purposes and at a time of crisis. So now they take this civil war as the basis for this crisis. So why does he have to get involved in the civil war? First of all, there are two crises that recur in the, the religious literature for which divine intervention is necessary. One uh, very common one is that bad creatures are taking over the world. You're getting creatures like Kamsa and like Duryodhana, who's also a demonic figure, uh, or Ravana, or uh, uh, Hiranyakashipu. There are all these series of bad actors, right, who come to attain too much power and are able to overpower the gods or overpower the Brahmins, et cetera, et cetera. God has to come in to get rid of these guys, right? So you have the uh, Narasimha avatara to get rid of this one guy, where God enters history for the sake of a single person, which is like the paradigmatic bhakti tradition, that there's the demon prince, Prahlada, who's a Vaishnava bhakti. He, bhakta, he, he uh, calls on him. Uh, and then you have um, the Ramayana, of course, you have where God has to take a human form in order to kill this terrible Rakshasa and so on and so forth. But there's another reason that God enters the world in, in certain cases, which is there's this theory of overpopulation that you see in the ancient Indian text, mm -hmm. particularly Mahabharata, that at points in history, there are too many people and the world gets burdened by people. Sometimes they're bad people. Sometimes they're demonic people, as in the Mahabharata. Sometimes they're just plain people or too many kings, which is another thing. So in the, the Krishna avatar uh, has two moments, particular moments. One is the childhood of Krishna, where he comes in to get rid of Kamsa, his uncle, and all these other. But then there's the Mahabharata, where you have not only a demonic infestation, but too many people. So the earth herself cries out. The earth asks for an intervention. So the idea is to actually exterminate large numbers of people, which is a popular theme in the Mahabharata particularly, both with the incarnation of Parashurama, who exterminates the Kshatriyas 21 times. It's a popular story in the Mahabharata. It's told about four or five times and alluded to many more times in the Mahabharata. Um, so you get this thing, that uh, idea that this is really a text of Krishna Bhakti, most centrally known through the great Bhagavad Gita, which is put... So, but there is uh, one point that uh, was actually uh, pointed out by historian Lupinder Singh, uh, because Lord Krishna plays an important role in Mahabharata, but the earliest inscriptions from Mathura and around that area do not attest his presence. So there is... Uh, how do we actually then uh, come to a conclusion that, you know, Krishna, Lord Krishna had actually was there during this time when Mahabharata actually took place, the war actually took place. That's just it. We don't have a lot of material evidence for these things. We do have a reference to a uh, Krishna Devaki Putra in the Chandogya Upanishad. So this was a figure that was known uh, in deeper antiquity. But of course, there's nothing more said about him that would bear on the Mahabharata. But the, the name, you know, is very, very suggestive. This is Krishna, who's the son of Devaki, just as we learn in the Mahabharata, Bhagavata, Harivamsha uh, tradition. So um, let me sort of bring us a little bit to a close because we, we want to have uh, some time for questions, right? So, so the text itself is filled with religious teachings that consolidate the teachings of the Upanishads, essentially. So you have the Gita itself, of course, you have the uh, Sanat Sujatiya in the fifth book, uh, the Moksha Dharma Parvan, 
all of these things are put in to turn this into a religious and a philosophical text. So if it's the great book of Dharma, why does it end so miserably? Because Vyasa designed it to end miserably, because almost all the, in fact, all the central characters of the uh, epic either die miserably in battle or in their sleep or murdered, or essentially the great heroes trek sadly off into the Himalayas and drop dead on the path one by one on their way to heaven. So uh, if it's a book about Dharma, this is how um, Vyasa concludes his great Dharma Shastra, the Mahabharata. He says, Urdvabahur viraumi yesha nakascha chit shunoti mam dharma artascha karmascha kimartam nasayyate I cry out with my arms upraised, but no one listens to me. Dharma is the source of both profit and pleasure. Why then is it not practiced? So there is a cautionary tale there. In other words, people who involve themselves in things of the world wind up losing out in the great spiritual journey, so to speak. So the real thrust is that you should seek moksha. And how do you do that? Just as the Gita teaches, just as these other passages and the Upanishads teach, you have to cultivate an attitude of detachment from the world, nirveda, not all the grabbing for power, not all the lust for pleasure, for women, for wealth, but to detach yourself. This is the message. And still he laments that uh, people don't uh, do it. So let me return very briefly now to the, the question of the of mythology. Uh, the, the whole story is now enshrined in a kind of framework of mythology. It really takes the age-old, very familiar Vedic mythological trope of the battle between the devas and the asuras. This is very standard. And plays it into human history. So what you're seeing in the Mahabharata is a reenactment of that battle. Because remember, the, what you have is a, an, a case of the battle of the devas and asuras, which goes on endlessly, right? When the God, demons are defeated in one instance, they flee to the earth and take the form of rapacious demonic kings. This is the problem of the earth. The earth then goes to Lord Brahma, to Lord Vishnu Narayana, and mm -hmm. begs for intervention. So he then sends the gods down to take on these avataric forms Every one of the characters in the Mahabharata is an avatara. And then he himself joins in, Vishnu. And this becomes a kind of historicization of the mythological framework of the whole and ancient culture of literature. Everything surrounds around that kind of battle between dharma and adharma and their in, in pers uh, personifications, that is the, the devas and asuras. So this is part of that story on a mythological level. And they bring in very famous myths from the past all the time about Indra and Vritra and so on and so forth. So it, it frames it, cloaks itself in mythology, but I, I don't think the text itself should be called a, a, a myth. Uh, Exactly. So it, it, it's a it's what I would say is it, it's it's an itihasa, but in in the terms that the, the tradition understood history, it is a kavya obviously it is a shastra, and it is a uh, teaching method for how to live in the world how, what you know how to respect your elders how to respect uh, the brahmins and so on so. Uh, in answer to the question, is it history or mythology? I would say, yes, it's both of those things and a great deal more. So let, let me just leave it at so, that and talk about it. So, so there is uh, no one way or like no hard way to differentiate mythology from history in a magnificent text like the Mahabharata. Yes. So, but I then was... also there is one question uh, that comes to my mind is that uh, there is, we are aware that there is a gap between the compilation and the composition of the text because it was initially in the form of spriti that it was passed on. So how then do we know that what was the original form of the text? And another related thing to this would be uh, there are so many interpolations and later editions that took place uh, during over the uh, course of the compilation over so many centuries. So 
can we say that these interpolations also had a role to play in adding the mythological character to the text? I'm sure that's true. The uh, you know, there's no way of recovering the original Mahabharata. I mean, this has been a fantasy of uh, European scholars for for generations, but you can't do it because the oldest available manuscripts of the Mahabharata are around the 10th or 11th, uh, 12th century of, of the common era. And, and this text had been in, in composition and development for centuries before that. So the best you can do is what the scholars at the Bandark Oriental Research Institute did, was do a critical edition, which is just a, a man-made product, uh, to try to approach the archetyped, uh, archetype of its text from which uh, other manuscript traditions derive. So the, this has a long history before we really have deep in, insight into it. There is, of course, famously a, a reference in the, uh, one of the Shrauta Sutras to a 24,000 verse Bharata that some people have thought must have been the kernel of what became the Mahabharata uh, of 100,000 Samad verses uh, over the course of time. So, I mean, probably, and then this, this is just uh, a hypothesis, that these texts, both, both epics, originally perhaps derived from these uh, bardic uh, genealogies that were told to kings. Kings kept in their courts these these sutas and uh, uh, charanas, bards, singers, who built up the legitimacy and glory of the king by singing about his glorious ancestors and the wonderful things they did, like Bhagiratha, who brought the Ganges down from heaven, or Bharata, or Dushyanta, all these kind of extraordinary stories, which add to the glory and uh, legitimacy, you might say, of the lineage. So these stories were there, right? Because you tell the king the stories of his own uh, an ancestors and how wonderful they were and how they all descended from the heavens themselves. Because after all, the two great epic families are all descended, not only from great kings and sages, but from divinities, right? This is the, mm -hmm. the lunar race of kings, right? This is the Chandra Vamsha, Soma Vamsha, and the Ramayana is the, is the Surya Vamsha. These are, these are not ordinary people. These are people descended directly from luminous heavenly bodies. And, uh, and so around many those... dynasties, so many mm -hmm. dynasties after uh, these epics have actually traced their ancestry to these epics, to these genealogies. Absolutely. Absolutely, because it lends power, glory, and legitimacy, just as it did in antiquity. Right. So naturally, these stories then get out, they're pop they become popular tales, and people want more, and you know, there's probably a response in audiences because these were performative texts. We know from the Ramayana that the disciples of Valmiki take the show on the road, literally. They go out and they sing this story at the crossroads and the marketplaces, and people are astonished and amazed by the beauty and the power and the glory of these story. So naturally, there's an, in, uh, an impetus and, and a motive to expand on these stories. And so you get the growth of these stories over time in different places. And this, and then of course, when you start a manuscript tradition, these, this story is written down all over India in different scripts, which are not only which are not always mutually intelligible. So you get these traditions. There's the northern uh, tradition recension, there's the southern recension, there's an eastern and a western recension, and then there are different sub-recensions by script, mightily script. Tamil script, Grantha script, Devanagari. And so the story gradually morphs in different directions. So the job of a, a scholar like the uh, people at the Oriental Institute so well, is to try to sort out what has been added since the earliest manuscripts were available. And that's not by any means going back to the origin of these poems. So a lot of it's hypothetical. But here you have this magnificent text, you know, that really tend to define uh, many of the things about culture. And they're still very much in discussion today. As I was mentioning to you the other night, the, there's a, the difference between the Mahabharata Ramayana on the one hand and the Iliad and the Odyssey and those epics on the other hand is that these are the only epics of antiquity that belong to a living 
vibrant religious community today, all over right. through its history, whereas all those ancient epics from the Mediterranean world and so on belong to religious cultures that died thousands of years ago. So nobody, you know, this Iliad's a great literary text and they teach it in schools and Achilles is a great hero, but nobody worships those Olympian gods anymore. Mm -hmm. This is a big difference because this is a text that has really deeply imbricated with the religious cultures of India. And I say cultures plurally because these stories have a lot of impact in Buddhist texts, in Jain texts particularly. There are many Jain Ramayanas, Jain Mahabharatas, and this then spills over into Southeast Asia, uh, where you start to get Islamic versions, you know, like the Hikayat Sri Rama. Uh, or the uh, in Buddhist versions of uh, uh, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, Persian versions of the uh, Ramayana, like the Razamnama in India. It's a text that the cultural heart of which is widely appealing to people, even beyond their particular religious affiliation. But of course, they remain central texts of Hinduism, particularly the Gita and the Ramayana uh, as, as the kind of first truly Vaishnava text, uh, mm -hmm. out of which all the Puranas and other things uh, derive themselves. So, so what, from what we have gathered so far, it is safe to say that it is extremely difficult to arrive at a definitive conclusion uh, to this uh, novel that we have, that I have yes. today. I mean, this is why, as you, you pointed out, people are still arguing over this, right? Uh, because it, it's so fascinating a text and so important a text. And yet it has, it, it's, it's mysterious in a lot of ways because we don't know exactly how it took place, how it grew into its present form, uh, because that's took place very, very long ago. And we don't have much testimonia for it. As you said, there are some pottery remains, the archeology, span which don't tell you a lot about the people who lived that. And uh, the text, in a sense, become by default texts that are have uh, swata pramanyam, because the the only histori history we really know about those texts is from the texts themselves. So, right? uh, can you elaborate what is swata pramanyam? That means they authorize themselves. I said it's it's a term that oh, the yes, Mimamsa yes. use for Vedic Vedic texts. This is you can't question them because they. Uh, themselves are, author are authoritative beyond human rationality or questioning and so on. And, the, and what I was saying earlier was that for the indigenous tradition of, of ancient India, that quality of the Vedas spills over into uh, these texts, which continually refer themselves as the Veda. I mean, not only did it, it, does the Mahabharata call itself the uh, the Veda for the women and Shudras, it also, there's this whole tradition that is the Panchamo Veda, the fifth Veda, right? There's the traditional four Vedas, you know, Rig Veda, Tarva Veda, Yajur Veda, uh, and Sama Veda. And then there's Panchamo Veda, Mahabharata, the fifth Veda, because this is the Veda that makes the other Vedas intelligible to masses of people and brings them into a cultural uh, sphere, regardless of what their regional language may be or their local traditions may be, still there's these mm -hmm. texts that bind a culture uh, together because everybody knows these stories. You know, as uh, the late uh, poet, my old friend uh, A.K. Ramanujan famously said, in India, no one ever hears the Mahabharata for the first time. Mm -hmm. Right, because you always know it, <laughs> because people talk about okay. it. You know, if you read it, you're constantly have debates in parliament or in the newspaper or even in um, advertisement. People are always making reference to these characters. Everybody knows exactly what it is, you know, uh, who Arjuna is and who Rama is. The, of course, Rama, the Ramayana, has become very central to the political life of, of contemporary right. India. So you can't really um, get away so from these texts. So we would like to invite a participant to ask a question because they uh, you can see a question coming in from Vedan. Uh, we'd like to invite Vedan on screen. Uh, please create, give a brief introduction of yourself and we may ask a question. So we'll, uh, we're waiting for Vedan to join in. Hello. 
Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for this beautiful session, and thank you, Doreen, for hosting this. Um, I'm Vedant Pofre. Uh, I am a, a sort of a researcher on scriptures myself, um, and um, I followed your work, uh, Professor, for a longest time, and it's it's a pleasure to speak with you right now. Uh, okay. My question from the uh, Q and A was: uh, What do you think about the Indra influence or the references to Indra in the scriptures before it was taken over by the Vaishnava influence where uh, Vishnu becomes the central character? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, as you know, the, you know, if you look at the Vedic mythology, uh, the Vedic history, say from the Rig Veda, uh, there are different sort of stages in which different divinities seem to have been prominent and then become less prominent. So there are a few hymns that deal with a very age-old Indo-European couple of, of father sky and mother earth, Dyaoth Prithivi, right? But and, and that's a powerful theme in uh, Greek and Roman mythology. But there are only a few hymns and they, they really go out of practice. Then you start to see the emergence of figures like Varuna and so on. But by the time of the full formation of the Vedic corpus, Indra has emerged as the, the great divinity, the, the overwhelming majority of uh, hymns in the Rig Veda. Uh, are to three divinities, really Indra, Agni, and Soma. But Indra def definitely emerges then as classically the king of the gods. But he's associated with Vishnu, right? Uh, in fact, Vishnu is referred to often as Upendra, little Indra, because there are several hymns, and, and Vishnu doesn't have a great presence in the uh, Rig Veda. But where he does appear, he's often an ally of Indra. And, you know, that he, with the, the phrase says, step forward widely, uh, Indra, to make a path for the gods and so on and so forth. So there's a close association of Indra with uh, uh, Vishnu. As you move into the post-Vedic period, that equation begins to shift and Vishnu continues to uh, gain popularity and importance. And when they identify the Vishnu with the sacrifice itself, which is the critical thing in the Brahmanas, right? Vishnu is the sacrifice. And so Indra becomes relegated to a kind of static position as the, quote, king of the gods. But it's the Vedic gods, not Indra anymore. Indra has now emerged from those that cast of characters of the Vedic gods to be a kind of supreme divinity actually equated with the Upanishadic notion of Brahman, the absolute, who then pretends to enter the world as an uh, avatara, pretends because it's all Maya, really, it's Leela, he's not really entering the world. As the Bhagavata puts it in the case of uh, Krishna, he says, oh, uh, what a joke that the being that who encompasses the entire world should be confined in the womb of a woman, you see. So uh, in that case, you have a, a new theology in which Vishnu, Shiva, and to some extent Brahma are, get outside the caste of the devas. So the devas are these figures who belong to that old mythology. They're always fighting with the asuras, but they can't really succeed without in, invoking Indra, right? Because the, in the Mahabharata, Indra becomes a kind of clownish figure, actually. He's a lecher. He gets cursed by people. He's uh, paralyzed by people. You know, this he's kind of a bit of a joke, uh, Indra, uh, because it's clearly become a, a, a religion of, of Vaishnavism in which this old mythology continues to exist. And that works its way through the literature throughout, you know, in the kavyas and plays and so on. So Indra is, is Mahendra, the great king of the gods, but he's, you know, vulnerable. He's constantly getting humiliated or cursed or, you know, because of his uh, excessive sexuality, his, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's, you know, has really de de declined in status. You know, they still refer to the Indra festival and it becomes a fixed sort of trope. Well, you know, a, a fallen warrior is frequently compared to the Indra Yupa, the Indra pole, which is knocked down at the end of the Indra Mahotsava and so on and so forth. But locally, you know, he's pushed aside. You know, uh, for example, in the if you look at the Harivamsha and the Bhagavata Purana, you know, there's that whole uh, episode of the Giri Govardhana, right? 
where uh, the villagers are worshippers of uh, Indra and Krishna, the child says, ah, don't bother with him, he's an idiot. And they say no, and, and so he persuades them not to worship Indra anymore. So Indra decides to punish them by hurling an enormous cataclysmic storm at them. So then uh, Krishna picks up his the mountain on his finger, right? And holds it as an umbrella over them. And then Indra is humiliated. So you can see there's an actual mythological transfer of power there with the great Indra. Sir, sir, I would one. like to ask one question, sir. Mm -hmm. So is it even necessary to uh, fit mythology and history against each other? Like, do they have to be strictly differentiated in a text like this or in any sense? Not necessarily. I mean, because as I'm saying, you can, you can put historical events in a mythological framework, as, as the Mahabharata clearly does, right? So the, the Mahabharata civil war, which is, you know, can be seen on a, on a, on a local level simply as a, a squabble over a kingdom by two warring clans, so to speak, uh, becomes part of the supervening myth of the Devasura war, right? Because the, the Kauravas are actually uh, Danavas, they're actually demons. And the Pandavas are actually devas. You know, each one is the incarnation of uh, either Indra, right? But Indra, as the uh, most powerful of the uh, divinities in a warlike setting, becomes Arjuna, right? But Arjuna is not the chief brother even anymore. It's Yudhishthira, because it's Dharma, which now has superseded Indra in that lineage, right? So you get first Dharma, then Bhima with you know this Vayu Putra, then you get Arjuna and then the the, the lesser twins, uh Nakul and Sahadeva. So yes, I, in other words, mythology is always there, and every culture uses it. You know, every country, modern country goes to war with the idea that God is on their side, right? right. They also have chaplains and prayers, and they say, you know, God may bless us. And you have even like crazy things like in this recent election uh, just that took place in the United States, there are these, uh, some of these characters are these very, very uh, arch, what you would call Christian uh, dominationists, right? They want America to be an entirely Christian country. So one of those characters who was uh, running as the governor of the state of Pennsylvania lost the election and his followers are now out there praying to God, to change the election, right? They, they, mm -hmm. And they had films of these people. They're just calling on God to change the election. We want this guy to be the governor because he's a true Christian. And worse, the guy who won is Jewish, which was even worse for them. But so, you know, people still have mythological thinking, certainly. Yes. Uh, and you apply it to uh, current events, sometimes disastrously, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, if, and if you carry these, mythic thinking too far you can see like what's happened to mr putin in russia this idea of the great russian imperium you know the great chakravartin so to speak of the slavic lands is going to just completely wipe out the ukrainians and then you come up against reality and it's not a pretty picture because this myth of uh you know slavic supremacy and russian glory comes up against the hard facts of history and, and uh, has resulted in this uh, horrible situation in Europe. So yeah, everybody has their own personal mythologies. And, and you know, going back to these revered figures in history uh, whom we're supposed to model ourselves on, right? Right? Exactly. So this, you should always behave like Rama, never like Ravana. Yeah. This is the basis. Of, so, but of, in this context, so, so we are saying that Mahabharat or Ramayana were teaching us Dharma. They're trying yeah. to teach us Dharma. But we also see how Draupadi's uh, disrobing, uh, the Vastraharan that took place, is actually an act of humiliation. And uh, if Krishna, Lord Krishna would not have entered the scene, then it would have uh, not been an act of dharma. So, so how do you explain that? No, but these are the, these are the, the reasons why I was talking about these as cautionary tales. It's because okay. the uh, Duryodhana and his kinsmen do this horrible thing to Draupadi. Draupadi is constantly being humiliated. This is not the only time. 
she gets abducted, she gets uh, attacked by Kichaka, she gets abducted by Jayadrata, all kinds of terrible things. And she's very much at the center of this. But because they do those things, that war becomes inevitable. You know, there's always this idea of negotiation back and forth, but the fact of this unforgivable uh, a sexual assault, really, on Draupadi, just like the unforgivable uh, sexually motivated abduction of Sita in the Ramayana, Sita. becomes yes. the, the critical factor in the dharmic retribution that uh, that befalls the perpetrators. So uh, that's why, in a sense, it's a, it's a cautionary tale. Look what happened to these people when they did these horrible things. Now, of course, the Mahabharata is kind of odd in the way because it brings in that depopulation myth. So actually, the horrible things happen to everybody, good, bad, and ugly. <laughs> there's, there's not much way out. But that, too, is a cautionary tale because fighting, grasping, wishing for things, sensual things in the world is the adharmic path, finally, that leads only to oh. disaster. And in the religious sense, it leads to constant rebirth and not always in a very good way. So the goal of the uh, Mahabharata, like the religious text it derives from, is moksha, right? And moksha can be attained in the Kali age through Krishna Bhakti, rather than through yajna. You know, it was sacrifice, mm -hmm. in, in the, right. and then it was tapas, and then it was so on. But in the Kali age, there's nothing left to us but bhakti. But that's, in a sense, the, the easiest path if you only distance yourself mm -hmm. and only you cultivate nirveda. So Krishna comes up with this brilliant strategy to negotiate between renunciation, which you're seeing in massive form in early India with the people becoming Buddhist and Jain monks and nuns, right? These people are leaving the, whole, the household to, be, to seek- A reaction to Brahminism. Yeah, but then he says, you can stay in the world. You have to stay in the world and do your stuff, do your thing, but don't attach yourself to it. This is uh, nishkama karma, right? Mm -hmm. This is, this is the, te the central, like, worldly teaching, you might say, of the Gita, is that uh, never mm -hmm. mind, uh, don't do actions with uh, an eye toward gain, pleasure, or, or whatever, right? That is, you have to be a kind of person who is a stitta pragna, who's solid, stable mind, who is dis detached from uh, kama and artha and uh, uh, so on, right? And then you can do your work in the world if it's your appropriate work in the world, right? Krishna, Karjuna has to fight, which is very violent, right? Why? Because he's a kshatriya, and that's the, the kshatriya dharma, you fight. It involves killing people, even your own relatives. It's all right. Just detach yourself from it. In other words, don't right. care about it. Just, you know, this, uh, you know, you have to cultivate a detachment from the karma pala, right? Karmaneva karaste ma paleshu kadachana, right? This is the central teaching in that part of the Gita. You're familiar with, right? Karmani eva dikara. Say your concern is with uh, your action, karma, right? Ma paleshu kadachana. Never with regard to the consequences, the fruits of the action. That that can you know be read several ways, and not always in a good way. But uh, in any case, that's the teaching in the Gita, and that's the teaching in the Mahabharata. In the end, where uh, Vyasa says. You can find out on Artha, Kama, and, Mok, and uh, Dharma, Artha, and Kama in so many other texts, but only in this text do you find the way out of that problem, that human problem right. of being attached to the world, because the attachment to the world in the uh, Hindu context, in the Vedanta context, is the source of endless, unpleasant rebirth, right? Punarapi right. jananam and so on and so forth. You keep getting born and then reborn. And it's not considered a good thing. It's considered a bad thing. The, the goal of these religious systems then is the escape. There's moksha. moksha from yes. all the fighting and the fussing and the, you know, worrying about money and jobs and cattle and so on and so forth. So it's right. a teaching text in that way. And he's mm -hmm. despairing at the end, as I said, because no one listens to him. Right, I've taught you this great lesson, but nobody cares. 
shrunoti mind, nobody listens to me. Uh, why doesn't people really practice dharma? That's mm-hmm. like a human problem from antiquity to the present. Also, if so I will, may, uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, Bhandarkar in his Proglema, who uh, refers to the Chiraharana episode as, as an interpolation itself uh, to justify the brutal actions of the Pandavas in the war later on. Um, uh, my question is a bit unrelated, but uh, Vivek Debroy, in his introduction to the translation, um, proposes an idea that the war with the Trigartas in, in the Agyatvasa period uh, could be the root of historicity in Mahabharata, which then was mythicized um, as the time went on. Um, what do you think about it? Well, I would like to know. I would say one thing we can't do is rewrite the Mahabharata. We can't decide that shouldn't be there. That, that was the problem with it. You know, people can constantly try to hack away at the Mahabharata and take out things they think they don't like and so on. So there've been various strategies. People say, well, it's only the Kshatriya portions of the Mahabharata that really are the real Mahabharata. Get rid of all the stories, get rid of all that. Or it's um, it's only the Trishtub verses of the Mahabharata, not the shloka verses uh, that are the Mahabharata. But these are imaginative constructions. Uh, the the uh, Harana, the, the Draupadi Vastra Harana, is very central emotionally to the Mahabharata, just as the uh, Sita Harana, Apaharana, is central to the uh, Ramayana. And so uh, both epics, in a sense, build their stories around that. Uh, so why should we take it out? And, and what have you left then, you know? So I, I'm really against dissecting the text and hacking it up because we have no authority to do it. Uh, so you can imagine as you like the original Mahabharata, it hadn't this, then it hadn't that, but there's absolutely no evidence for that. You don't have a ver- different versions of it that don't have that. I mean, the one thing that... Uh, so then how do we place... Uh the Mahabharata in a chronological uh, sense that how do we know that when it was actually uh, compiled or it began its compilation? Well, as I, the stories themselves probably are, are quite antiquated and, and probably go back to the Vedic period because these are these great ancestors and genealogies that people keep. The actual poem is probably composed, I think, later than the Ramayana, actually, in a kind of... Um, period of of anxiety probably in india because we you know from from the first centuries on would you start getting this sort of a era of invasions uh so which, but then uh, some, uh, so then some uh, arguments uh, are there that uh, the ramabhar is actually early uh, was actually earlier than the ramayana because of the strong uh, women characters that were portrayed in a stronger sense that they were actually of a, of an earlier period than the ramayana well, I'm, I'm not. I'm talking now about the composition of the poem as we know it. Uh, I'm sure okay. much of the uh, material of the Mahabharata is is quite uh, antique. That's what I was saying. But I'm talking about the mm. actual production because it, it, I'm just saying, and this is simply speculative, that uh, the the text, unlike the Ramayana, has a very gloomy tone, especially toward its end. Right. This is what you know. People are talking about that when Abhinava says the the the, the virasavasana, the wretched, miserable end of the Pandavas and the Yadavas. It's filled with violence, genocides, over and over again. I've written an article about all the genocidal murders of creatures in the uh, humans and creatures in the Mahabharata. There was this article titled, taking a phrase from the Mahabharata, Agharbat, down to the embryos in the womb killing you know it, it, it can be an ugly text and uh it ends in this kind of sort of anomie of the, the the disaster that befalls even the good guys doesn't have a happy ending and in fact in chronological period it runs into the uh the Kali age and the Kali age is what where you start to see Mlecha Raj when you see Mlecha's ruling and it's kind of anticipating that you know you have to read the Harivamsha also with the uh, Mahabharata. This is how it was intended. And the critical edition contains the Harivamsha as well. Uh, so there's a continuous problem because the, the life of Krishna is not really filled out in the 
uh, Mahabharata per se. There are allusions to his childhood in the um, Shishupalavada episode in the Sabha Parvan when uh, Shishupala is taunting him about these childhood things. Oh, so you held up a mountain. It wasn't a very big mountain, this kind of ridiculous stuff. And uh, But there's no coherent Krishna Charitra there as Bunkim called it. The Krishna Charitra really is in the Haribamsha and in the later Puranic texts that derive from it, principally the Vishnu Purana and the uh, Bhagavatam. But uh, it's a time, I think, of these invasions, you could say, is, is a, a time of crisis for culture at that time, the Bhanakal culture. What's happening? On the one hand, you have young people going off mm -hmm. in large numbers to become Buddhist monks or Jain monks, right? So abandoning the whole Brahmanical thing and the whole worldly life. And then you have these Kushanas and Hunas uh, coming into India and uh, Greeks in the Northwest, all these things are going on. And maybe this is uh, something of concern and why maybe it puts a gloomy cast on the Mahabharata and we're looking toward the head of the, uh, the terrible Kali age. If you look at the Ramayana, it ends on a brilliantly happy note. And it says, when Rama, when Rama was ruling in Ayodhya, Krita Yuga Yata, it was just like in the Krita Yuga. There was no crime, no disease, no pain, no child predeceased its parent, no women disobeyed their husband. So it does go back to that same kind of gendered uh, business there. Uh, mm -hmm. Sita, by the way, I should say, and my wife has written about this a lot, is that is a much stronger character in Valmiki than uh she is typically represented in later versions not so passive she has a, a voice and she is not uh above uh scolding her husband in very stark terms uh so she's a more interesting character than she generally gets uh, a reputation for so we'll have to move towards the conclusion of this session huh. and uh, so what will be your End remarks, sir. Mahabharata. Is it a history or mythology? It's all of those things. It's all of those things. It is it, it says of itself, right? Whatever is here is in other texts. Whatever is not here, you won't see anywhere else. So it purports to be a, a, a history, a Dharma Shastra, a uh, religious text, and uh, also keep in mind it's a kavya. It's a poem which is a literary creation. <clears throat> and the poet has a lot of freedom in writing a poem. He defines his characters. <clears throat> he invents the dialogue and puts it into uh, shloka and other meters uh, and creates a literary uh, document, much like I was saying earlier, a historical novel. And it draws on all the mythological heritage uh, of ancient India to create this wonderful <laughs> text, you know, which, which is like definitive at its time of Indian culture as viewed from a certain elitist perspective, because the text is entirely devoted to Brahmins and Kshatriyas after all. Uh, you get very little uh, representation of lower social units and those you get are not very pretty like the murder of a Nishada family just to cover their escape or the cutting off the thumb of uh, Ekalobia and so on. They don't have a lot of uh, sympathy for, for the Nishadas, the tribal groups and so on. These are definitely spiritual and uh, royal elites and it's all about their story. So in, in that sense, it's not comprehensive about the other orders of society. They're really not concerned much with it. But other than that, from that point of view, this is a, a, a conspective view of the culture and history of India and mythology of India as they saw it. So it is, uh, that's why it's uh, the Mahabharata, the great uh, work of, uh, of traditional India and continues to be held in, in great reverence so, and deservedly so. So since this is a very interesting session that's going on, we have one more question coming in from Dishan. Uh, so we will take this question, sir. Okay. Hello, Dishan. Uh, hello, Professor Goldman. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are. Um, uh, I, I was reading Mahabharata from different phrases. I have read the Gita, Gita Press. I have, uh, I have read some of the Bori phrases. And one of the questions that struck me was the 
that uh, Lord Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita that Yada Yada Hi Dharma Se Glani Bravati Bharata Abhyutana Ma Dharma Se Tadat Maane Sujamita that whenever there is an uh, there is a Adham the Adham will rise on this planet Lord Vishnu will take an avatar to destroy the Adham and establish the Adham again so what was the need of a two avatars of vishnu at the same time there was parshuram avatar to cleanse the earth then there was ram avatar at the same time the ram avatar and parshuram avatar met at janakpuri at uh, uh, sita swayamber and the same yes. happened at the kurukshetra sabha where lord krishna and lord parshuram met so if there was one avatar of vishnu on this planet how what was the need of one more avatar to cleanse the other from earth that was That's a question strike, striking me for a long time Okay, that's a very interesting question. <clears throat> well, the first answer is that these two events took place at vastly different times, right? Because what we learn at the beginning of the Mahabharata is that um, this the battle, you remember the, the, the framing the story is to telling the story in the past, right? It, it's a retrospective. It's, it's what's being told to Janamejaya and to the sages of the Naimisha forest. So that the battle of the Kurukshetra, which is the era of Krishna, took place at the junction of the Dwapara and Kali Yugas, right? And on that very spot, Kurukshetra, one whole Yuga ago, right? On that very same spot, Rama Jamadagniya exterminated the Kshatriyas 21 times. So there's a Yuga's length between the actual action of, uh, uh, of uh, Rama Jamadagniya. Why is he there meeting uh, Krishna then, a whole yuga later, because he's one of the Chirajivans. You know, there are these seven figures in, in the traditional uh, history of India who live forever, essentially, from yuga to yuga. And uh, Rama, so-called Parashurama, although they don't use that term in the Mahabharata, is one of those. So he is sort of involved with one of those depopulational crises back at the end of the uh, uh, Treta to the Dvapara Yuga at the Tirta Samanta Panchaka, which later on becomes Kurukshetra. So they're tying those things completely uh, together and yet a whole Yuga apart. And that's why he lives on and he also gets himself involved in the Ramayana as well. If you recall, there's a, a tense confrontation between the Bhargava Rama and Rama in the first book of the Ramayana, where you can see the one avatara superseding the other because a, a the uh, Parashurama is angered because Rama broke Shiva's bow. And he said, a real man, here's a real bow. Try to break Vishnu's bow. And Rama, of course, seizes it because he is Vishnu and is able to handle the bow. And that humiliates. Uh, so Parashurama in the Mahabharata, current era, that is in the pre-Kali age, is a figure in the text. And he's, he's important. He's a teacher of Bhishma and so on and so forth. But his avataric mission such as it was, which is a peculiar one, uh, is long in the past. So there's no real contradiction there. Okay, so uh, according to you that every avatar of Lord Vishnu has some purpose and after that purpose is finished, they don't involve in other activities in this planet. No, no, but he does remain in the planet doing things because he's a, a Chiraji then, right? He doesn't, yeah. most, of the, yeah. most of the avatars of Vishnu, of Vishnu, if you look at them, they do one job and then they disappear, right? Whether it's the Varaha, or the Kurma, or the Matsya, or Narasimha, Vamana, they all come for a specific purpose, they do that purpose, and then that illusory incarnation, after all, is removed and re re rever reverts back to the, the, the Lord himself, right, in his true form. But uh, the, the ones who actually uh, live on for long periods of time are, of course, uh, the Bhargava Rama, Krishna, because he has that childhood mission, which is killing off Kamsa. And then later on, he has that mission in the Mahabharata to deal with the overpopulation of the earth and get rid of the, the Asura kings, right? Then he dies at the end of that. Once the, uh, his people have killed each other off in the Musala Parvan, he leaves the earth. Rama is also a very long-lived one because after he uh, is, is consecrated finally, he rules for 11,000 years in the Treta. But other than that, then going on in the future, you have the Buddha added to this list, and then you have the Kalking Avatara. Most of the uh, avatars have a specific time-bound purpose, and, and that once that's accomplished. 
So uh, the uh, the purpose to continue what you said, it's right. It's paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chadushkritam, right? Dharma samstapanartha yasam bhavami yuge yuge. So yes. he has that job here, which is to reestablish dharma by getting rid of these bad actors and killing them, right? Vinashaya chadushkritam, destroy the evildoers. But unfortunately, in that war, he also destroys the the other guys who aren't evildoers. But after all, the, that has the purpose. The secondary purpose was relieving the uh, population of the earth and the ending of the heroic age of Dwapara and allowing the earth to uh, move into the Kali age, which is supposed to have taken place either with the consecration of Yudhishthira or the end of the war or the death of uh, the embodied uh, Lord Krishna uh, at the end of the uh, Musala Parvana. So I don't, I don't think it's really, it is curious to have uh, two avatars around at the same time, but uh, I don't think it's an, an impossible, uh, illogical thing. If you take so it, it is evident. That is evident now that anybody hardly looks at the time in an engaging discussion like this, but uh, we'll have to move towards the conclusion uh, yeah. today. And uh, well, in the conclusion, we can say that the epic weaves together an event-centered narrative where the core has a historical basis within a mythological framework, a broader mythological framework, right? And uh, because history has been redefined uh, over the centuries and uh, history is a field that needs constant rethinking, revisiting and reinterpretation of what is known and what is, needs to be known. Right, sir? Yes. So, but don't forget the kavya. Don't forget yes, the kavya. Absolutely. The beautiful poem. Uh, yes, intended yes, to exactly. move you to do various things, mainly to, right. you know, stabilize your mind and uh, reflect on the vanity of the world in many ways. Yeah. So we would like to thank Dr. Goldman for such an insightful and informative session. My pleasure. Sadhanam namo namaha. Namasteji to all of you. And thank you for your patience in listening to me rambling on. Then shall it was we a pleasure, this? sir. It was an honor. Okay, thanks Thank so you much. again, Dr. Goldman, and thanks to all the participants and viewers for joining in with us. You can watch this session on our YouTube platform, where you'll also find hundreds of other such informative debates and discussions. And we will be back with another intriguing session. Until then, make sure to like and subscribe to our channel and turn on the bell icon. We are in Agi